Welcome to the worship service of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in uh, Crofton, Gambrels, on this Sunday morning, March 22nd, 2020. I'm Pastor David Betzner. I'm the vacancy pastor at uh, St. Paul's. And I come to you this morning in this mode because of the uh, challenging and changing times we are facing related to the coronavirus. These services will be offered until we can proceed in a more normal pattern, whatever that might be. We're encouraging you to stay safe, stay connected, remain faithful, because God has always been and always will be faithful to us. We begin. In the name of the Father who created us and who recreates us, and in the name of the Son who redeemed us and made us his sons and daughters, his children, and in the name of the Holy Spirit who came to call us and convict us and connect us and empower us as we face the challenges and changes in our daily lives and especially in this time. Amen. Lord, you have said that faith and hope and love, these three are necessary. So we ask for faith, that you would help us to trust in your promises, to lean on the acts that you uh, have worked for us in the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. May these build us up, encourage us, and bless us. We ask for hope, a way through this time. Show us and help us to see the light of your Son, Christ, at the end of the tunnel of these times with its confusion and darkness and wonderment. Finally, we ask for love, that you would surround us with your love and in incarnate that love through us, through the support of family and friends. Make us lovers, Lord, in your name, so that others might know who you are and how you are for us. Amen. Daily life is a difficult thing, especially in our relationship with God. We often separate ourselves from him. We are broken people. We do things we should not do and we do things, we don't do things we should do. And so we come to him in confession this morning using as an opening this psalm. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. Had you desired it, I would have offered sacrifice, but you take no delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Have mercy on me according to your loving kindness, O God. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. I will stop now for a moment of silence for you to work, uh, think about the ways you have broken faith or relationship with God or others. Again, the words of our Lord. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out our offenses. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation, 
and uphold us with your free spirit. In and by the stead of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, we turn to our Lord's word. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and great of great kindness. He will not always accuse us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our wickedness. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so is his mercy great upon those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. As a father cares for his children, so does the Lord care for those who fear him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Blessed are those whose sins have been forgiven, whose evil deeds have been forgotten. Rejoice in the Lord, and go in peace. We join together now in the... Uh, Apostles' Creed. You may listen or participate. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our text for today is Psalm 23. You might want to keep it in front of you if you have a Bible at home or a resource for it on your uh, iPhone or your computer. Um, I will read it first and then we will speak about it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup it overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we approach this uh, psalm today, we come with a variety of feelings and perspectives and wonderments. You may be coming with some grief today because of the things that you've had to temporarily give up during this time. You come maybe with a little shock. Finally, all this is beginning to sink in and that can be heavy. Maybe your life, or more than likely, your life is turned a bit upside down. It may, in fact, be more calm, but it's not normal, and it doesn't feel normal. You may feel and be concerned about the unpredictability of what might happen today, tomorrow, the next day, the next month. In fact, you may uh, wonder many things. 
In times like these, we hold on tight for security. We look for hope. We need strength and patience. There's a whole list. We look for to family and friends and relationships that are necessary and helpful. My wife, Sally, would remind me when we were in crisis that I said, we'll get through this with God's help. Many years later, in a difficult time, she said to me, it has always helped me, Dave, when you have said that. I was encouraged by that to keep saying it, and I say it now. We will get through this with God's help. What are your go-tos in a time like this in our world? What do you go to that in addition to God's love and encouragement and hope gives you a way to manage these times. Pope John Paul VI, whose mother died when he was six years old, said that every time he got himself in a difficult and a situation, a time of challenge and testing, he always saw to his mind's eye, the smile of his mother. And every time those things happened to him, her radiant face just shined and it gave him encouragement and hope and it blessed him. So what are you doing? you find a good book to read? Are you doing a few home projects that you needed to do for a long time anyway and now you're finding the time? Are you getting time to take a run or do some kind of exercise? I know my time's gone up on electronics. I don't like it much, but it has, because I live alone, and I need connection and contact. Maybe you're finding time to do some things with the kids that you haven't done in a while. Speaking of kids, maybe you're having trouble getting them to understand and manage all the extra time they have on their hands. I'm sure at times that's not fun. Sometimes our children will cling more to us during times like this because they pick up in the wind, the atmosphere, in the mood, in the whatever it is that something going on. And it's not good. And they may cling to their little stuffed animal or the corner of their blanket or even you more than they usually do. For many of us that are seeking and looking or wanting a connection, the 23rd Psalm is something that we've known for a long time. It's our go-to in a lot of situations in our lives when we are in need. Our grandma would read it to us or our parents would uh, share it with us. Uh, for most of us, even if we're not, don't re really feel connected to the Lord, it's at least familiar to us. And that is the source I'm using for today's words with you. So I'll read it first. You may want to grab a Bible or put it on your computer or your iPhone so you can 
follow along. I'm hopeful that it will offer you some good thoughts and some encouragement and hope during this time. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup it overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, you know, this psalm was originally a psalm that a person would read before they went on a pilgrimage. Our life is really a pilgrimage. And this particular part of that pilgrimage, God is no less available than he has been before or he will be after. So let's look a little bit at the specifics of the psalm and what it might mean for us in this day and time. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, it's pretty clear there that if the Lord is the shepherd, we are the sheep. You got it. What an identity he has and we have, shepherd and sheep. You see, the psalm is about relationships. It's about the faithful shepherd's love and care and sacrifice and gifts for us and the goodness we receive through it and the response we make because of it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, means that God oversees and guides our journey through life. And he is, for us, our everything in terms of who we are and how we are because he took hold of us and made us his sons and daughters in our baptism. Practically, it means that we shall not be in want. I'm not sure it means exactly all of the material or practical things that we want. I think it means that our wants in relationship to God, our spiritual needs, our hope, our need for love and encouragement will be uh, provided through his uh, shepherdship, if you will. Verse 2 follows up. He makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters. How much more basic can you get than that? But those two things, eating and water and uh, rest, lying down, are really most of what we have to have. And maybe in this time it's becoming more evident how important those things are and how sometimes we take them for granted. So as we go in and out as his sheep during this time, we're reminded that God will provide our needs. Verse 3 says, He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I believe that the shepherd and the needs he supplies for us, for which we shall not want, restore our soul. 
our insides, a sense of wholeness or togetherness. But there's more. He leads us in the paths of righteousness. What it means is the righteousness he has given us in his son Christ are a path for us. That symbol becomes a little more realistic when you think about how when farmers were developing farmland using a wagon, they kept going in and out of the farm in exactly the same way. And eventually you knew what happened. You know what happened. Grooves were made and made really a roadway. In fact, I suspect in many cases the horse leading the wagon had needed no guidance from the rider because the wheels of that wagon stayed in the ruts or the grooves that had been made for it. That's what God's righteousness is for us. God has us in a groove. We're groovy in the tracks that he made for us through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. He's cut away for us a channel of forgiveness and faith and baptism and cross and hope for his name's sake. What does that mean? Well, his name's sake means he's done it for us so that others can see him through us. And when we're on the righteous path, the righteousness of God is at work through us and others are seeing the gifts God give us, gives us through forgiveness and hope and faith and abundance of life. So in this time, a difficult time, remember the Bible people read, maybe you. How are you living in this difficult time? In Christ's name. There is, of course, danger in our life, and here it is. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, this pilgrim psalm uh, sort of indicated that the pilgrim guy that was going on the journey to worship God was a trailblazer. You know, he was, he was going over new ground, untrodden ground, dangerous ground, you know, so he He's, he's certainly accosted by difficult situations, uh, robbers and, and wolves and the terrain and the lack of supplies and, and things like that. But it says here, even in that valley, and I suspect we can easily see the shadows that are in that valley now in our own lives and circumstance. Death is more in our face these days People are dying, lots of them. More will die. There will be more dangers, maybe different ones connected with this time because the usual things are not as available. Ah, trust me, the evil one will find a way to put us in danger. We are not afraid. God who came to be with us in the festival of Christmas remained, lived a life, died on a cross, rose again, and promises to be with us. In our baptism, we are yoked to him. Yoked means we are connected. So the things he gives us and earned for us 
We're tied to them, and they're always available. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In modern language, that's the offense and the defense. Well, rod is what? A thing that the shepherd used to drive away thieves and, and uh, dangerous animals, intruders, those kind of things. And the staff is that big crook was used for by the shepherd to hook around the sheep's neck and gently draw him in as he was straying from the flock. So, there he is when we're in the valley, beating off the enemy's defense and providing a way for us to continue in the path on which he set us. What a lot of people don't know about this psalm is that at the point we are in the psalm now is exactly 26 words in the Hebrew language into the, into the psalm. And from here on out, there are 26 words to the end. Now, some people seeing that have seen it as a sign that an indication that God is at the center of our lives. I'll leave that little numerical ditty to you. But I believe whether it's the 26 in or 26 out or whatever it is, God is at the center of our lives, yours and mine. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup, it overflows. Well, I used to think that uh, this table was prepared for me here and some distance away was the enemy, and I was safe because somehow God had provided a barrier for me. And I can look at the others and wave and say, hi, ha ha, I'm safe, you can't get me. And maybe that was true. But now I think it means that we are always in the presence of our enemy. in the grocery store, on the road, at work, in what particular situations or dilemmas we get ourselves into. And it seems apparently that there are more and more times when that is the case. God is there with us in the exact presence of our enemies. Sitting around the table in the restaurant, in the theater, at work. There are many risks in our lives which would diminish it, but God is there with us. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Wow. You know, we often are called to the bedside of a person who's dying to anoint them with oil. That anointing of oil is a ceremony of uh, lifting up, of, of a blessing, of putting an abundance of goodness as the oil is administered. We, we use the oil in services of reconciliation when someone wants a service. We anoint with oil to uh, uh, acknowledge that their royalty and loyalty of the relationship with God. My cup overflows. Wow, just think about that. Maybe we could say it another way, could we? That God's oil saturates our lives. Another word we could use that is often used in a situation where we wouldn't make this connection is that we are inebriated 
in God's oil. What do you think? How's it sound to say we're drunk on God's grace? However it sounds, that's what it means. God is there with us, protecting us, even in times when we are in great danger. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Perhaps we could read surely as only goodness and mercy. And another word that works at the end, only goodness and mercy pursues me. You see, God is a jealous God. He doesn't give up on us. He doesn't say, I'm done with you. He doesn't say, I don't want anything to do with you. Oh, it may feel like that to us sometimes. But he has come not to condemn us, but to save us. And I sort of think that this means when we look at our lives as pil people often do, and um, especially pilgrims who, pilgrims who return from a journey, they think about their going over and their coming back. And what they realize, and we also can know from this psalm, is that God is in front of us and behind us when we look over our shoulders so that we are in the center of God's grace. He takes us forward and he covers our back. Good stuff during a time like this to know. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That means that we are not uh, ever without having a home that we are no longer a stranger or a guest. The end of the psalm speaks of our promised uh, proper destiny, that in our long life enterprise, however many number of years it is, as we turn and return, God's presence it's with us. And that one day we will be in his presence. T.S. Eliot wrote, The end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. Yep. Here's what it means. It means that all through our life, we have God's love and presence from beginning to end and activity. Uh, he's involved in our daily journey, even when we do not recognize that he is. And we only have a little bit of idea what that means. We see through a glass darkly. But it, this verse by Eliot means when we get there, we will know fully what it means to be the sheep of the shepherd, one of God's children, a member of God's family. Those things will be fully realized. Now, I told you this psalm was a pilgrimage psalm. And of course, we could look at that as our pilgrimage in our life up to this point and our whole life being a pilgrimage in our faith. 
But I want you to know that I have seen it a little bit differently at times. I see the psalm, too, as an invitation. What that means is that if you're looking for a relationship with the shepherd, or you're needing to renew or restore that relationship with the shepherd, it's God's invitation. And he would be saying in all these things, come, I'll take care of your wants. I'll provide for your daily needs. I'll, I'll refresh your soul. I'll put you in the path of righteousness. I'll walk through the valley of the shadow with you. I will protect you. I will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. I will anoint you. I will saturate you with God's oil. And my goodness and mercy will surround you all of your life. It's not only a word of invitation, it's a word of promise. And I hope that this day you can hear that promise sealed sealed for you and for me in the life, death, and resurrection of God's Son, Christ. And a promised way through, which is what I understand the resurrection to be, the challenges and difficulties and changes of this life, whatever those might be, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now I'd like to pray, and I hope you will uh, participate along. You know, the Bible says, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock, and it will be open to you. And that's what prayer is, really. It's asking, it's seeking, it's knocking. And God's part is giving. Uh, God's part is helping us find. God's part is answering. So here we go. We start with our world, really the whole world, Lord, is uh, struggling, challenged uh, by the coronavirus and the implications of its presence in our world. And so we pray that you would help us find ways not only to uh, Take care of ourselves, uh, our own situation, our nation, but that all of us, all of us who are harmed in this time by this disease, this uh, pandemic, would have sense and find a way to work together and help each other. And that our view of life and our politics and our previous relationships would be diminished and not matter that much. That in this time, we would know that we're all human and we all are hurting and we all have needs. And so, Lord, we beg, give us the power of your spirit and work in the hearts and minds and lives of people who can come together for the benefit of our world in this time. Lord, we ask you to hear our prayer. We pray especially for those who are without or very limited in resources, whether that be monetary or, or, or work or food or, or housing, 
Uh, we're all feeling very limited at this time. Help us to understand the implications of that for particularly for those who have more limits than we. Keep us mindful when we live day to day in this time that we have a need only what we have a need. Help us to be more selfless in the grocery store so there are eggs and bread and toilet paper and practical things for others. Help us not to store up in barns like the man in the scripture who had barns and barns of grain. It won't help us. It certainly will hurt others. Wake us up to how we can pay attention to those who are less fortunate and less supplied. Amen. We pray especially that you would be with those who are necessary, uh, more necessary maybe in, in this time than other times, doctors and nurses and uh, police and ambulance and military and all of those who would be called necessary employees and help us to uh, give thanks for them in the way they're willing to put themselves in danger for our sake, for our goodness, for our ability to continue managing this crisis. Amen. Help us especially to think about those who have contracted the coronavirus. Help us to find ways to help and support and uh, give uh, help with them as they overcome or try to overcome the challenges of this illness. We know that some will die. And we pray that you would be with us that we do not grieve as those who have no hope. But help us to find ways to provide, which is very difficult given the challenges and shortages that we have. Be fullness for us, Lord, and for all those who are in need. Amen. Finally, we pray for uh, our leaders, our, our world leaders, our national leaders, our president, vice president, or our Republicans and Democrats, or all the people in our cities, our counties, and, and mayors, and boards of various kinds, and all those who you have given special calling to serve us. Help all of them to keep in mind the bigger picture. Help them all to think of the needs of others and the world and their communities above themselves. Help them all to find ways to cooperate and work together in this time of challenge and, and not continue to be sparring and playing tug of war about situations and decisions that need some action now? Help them, guide them, direct them, call them to live to the highest standard you have given them when you call them to serve. Amen. Finally, we commend all of ourselves into your care, trusting your mercy and love. And we pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you. The Lord would make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord would lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Hope to see you next week. God bless you.
be safe. Work together. Be faithful. God will always be. Amen.